Hello, everyone. Good afternoon. I, hope, I really hope you are enjoying our meeting, which has been very, very lively despite this uh, unusual virtual format. Uh, we all know that these meetings are always very special, so I think uh, it wouldn't be COVID that would make a key difference, would it? I am João Farrell Neff from Lisbon, Portugal, and together with me is Trina Mogensen from Denmark, who is one of the leaders in the field of host response to viral infection and uh, very well known to all of you. We are very delighted to be moderating this live session on innate immunity, which will have five presentations, four of which are very interesting and diverse case reports about patients with uh, protein kinase C delta deficiency, chronic granulomatous deficiency, terminal comp complement deficiencies, or mandibular susceptibility, susceptibility to my mycobacteria. We will also have a wonderful presentation on CGD microbiota. Before we start, and that's very, very important, I would like to remind you, the, pre the presenters, that you will have five minutes for your presentations, followed by two minutes of questions and answers, which will be led by me and training, Trina. To the, to the audience, please interact with us via the Q&A tool or by raising your hands. For the first, for the first questions after the presentations, please uh, prefer the Q&A tool uh, below, your uh, below your screens. Um, in the end, probably we'll have some time for uh, additional uh, questions. So then you can use the raise your hands functionality and we'll be here to, to let you talk. Trini, should we proceed for the first presentations? Uh, do you want to, pr to present our first speaker? Yes, so I wish to welcome Goncha and Sjoklu on a poster presentation entitled Mendelian Susceptibility of Mycobacterial Disease Due to Homozygous Protein Kinase C Delta Mutation in Two Siblings. Thank you. Uh, good afternoon. Uh, I'm Gonja. Uh, uh, the defined responsible mutation of uh, MSMD uh, are increasing. Uh, however, the genetic etiology of about half of them uh, has not been identified uh, yet. Uh, so I'm going to present um, two male siblings with homozygous mutation uh, that could be a new genetic etiology of MSMD. Uh, the siblings present uh, presentations and progressions were similar. Uh, they had fever, uh, purlampopul at BCG uh, vaccination area, and also uh, drained abscess in the left, uh, left axillary uh, region. In their physical examination, uh, there were hepatocyclone megaly and failure to try. Uh, in the follow-up, uh, generalized lymphadenopathies and autoimmune uh, hem hemolytic anemia occurred. Uh, in laboratory findings, uh, direct cums and uh, ANA uh, were positive. Uh, their platelet, uh, neutrophil, and lymphocytes counts were uh, between normal range. Uh, in flow cytometric uh, tests, uh, total B cells, uh, class switch, uh, and memory B cells uh, counts were normal. Uh, due to technical uh, reasons, uh, we couldn't identify mycobacterial agents uh, from a lymph node biopsy. Uh, other mycobacterial analyses were uh, all negative. We uh, performed PPD. Uh, patient two had uh, anergic. Uh, patient one had positive uh, tuberculin skin tests. Uh, their lymph node uh, biopsy show uh, as granulomatous inflammation. We identified homozygous mutation in a PRKCD gene by next generation sequencing. The patients and parents were confirmed by Sanger sequencing method. Their non consanguineous parents had heterozygous mutation and they were healthy. In mother's clinical history, she had two miscarriages. Uh, we couldn't uh, show uh, microbiological evidence uh, except positive tuberculin uh, skin test, uh, bisigitis, uh, abscess in axillary uh, lymph nodes, uh, lymphadenopathies, hepatocyclin megaly, histopathological chains with uh, granulomatous inflammation, and uh, good response to isoniazid and uh, rifampicin treatment uh, match our patients' possible MSMD. 
Our patients' mutation was uh, not uh, previously reported in uh, PR. PRKCD gene uh, and its phenotypic uh, effects is uh, unknown. A few uh, PRKCD cases have been reported in literature. Uh, in these cases, uh, these are lupus-like and ALPS-like diseases with skin and renal involvements. Differently, our patients uh, didn't have uh, these findings. Cells are uh, reviewed a uh, mechanism of uh, PRKCD. Uh, according to this, uh, it is highly probable uh, that the underlying mecha mechanism of MSMD is associated with uh, PRKCD, STAT1 pathway, uh, and uh, interferon gamma related gene uh, transcription. Uh, so uh, we believe uh, PRKCD mutation can cause MSMD. So uh, thank you for listening. Thank you very much for your presentation. Thank you. Um, and I would like to ask if there are any questions from the attendees. Mm, I don't see any raised hands right now. Are there any questions in the Q&A? Meanwhile, I have a question for you. So did you look at STAT1 phosphorylation or interferon gamma production from patient cells in response to any stimulus? Uh, interferon gamma, uh, we, 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 performed, we looked. Uh, their interferon gamma uh, is uh, absent, but STAT1, uh, we, unfortunately, uh, we didn't perform. But decreased interferon gamma levels? No, uh, de decreased, yeah. Yes, yes, okay. Yes, yes. <laughs> uh, can I, Trina? Can I yes. ask yeah. a question? Um, so for PRKCD, um, we know very well its role in the uh, B-cell signaling and uh, differentiation of the ALPS-like features. Um, it's not very well characterized in uh, monocytes and uh, cytokine production, at least in human that I know of. It's been well uh, uh, described in mice. Uh, do you think that uh, the lipoproliferation splenomegaly uh, that was present was uh, caused by mycobacteria, or do you think that it's uh, caused by the PRKCD directly deficiency? Because uh, that's what we see in those patients, the ALPS-like features. Uh, uh, we, we think um, uh, this uh, lymphoproliferation uh, uh, findings could be related to uh, PRKCD mutations uh, uh, with uh, MSMD. <laughs> yeah, uh, of course, uh, PRKCD uh, mutations uh, related to uh, lymphoproliferation, and our uh, patients had. PRKCD mutation. Yeah. Uh, so, but was the patient very ill, uh, systemically very ill with fever and uh, bad yeah, general they status? Had, they, they had fever. Prolonged fever? Yeah, prolonged fever. Okay. And, but you don't have evidence. Did you do bone marrow aspirates, for example, to look so, for uh, bone marrow aspirates, to look for uh, mycobacteria? Uh, unfortunately, uh, we, uh, uh, we, we couldn't show any mycobacterial agents uh, okay. for for uh, our technical uh, reasons. <laughs> and so okay. 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 Uh, actually, there's one question uh, to you from the audience from Taku Kuipas. Um, whether uh, they develop lupus-like symptoms. Uh, our patients, um, uh, clinical and laboratory findings didn't match uh, lupus criteria. Uh, uh, no skin rash, no arthritis, no nephritis, uh, no thrombostopenia and neutropenia. Uh, uh, and uh, our patients, uh, hemolytic anemia, uh, but, uh, 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 direct, direct comes positive anemia. 
uh, so uh, it's uh, we, we didn't think uh, from autoimmune hematica, yeah, uh, lupus or hematic anemia. Okay. Yeah. I think it's uh, kind of difficult to assume that this is, in fact, uh, another cause of MSCMD because we don't have uh, proof, enough proof, I think, that we have disseminated the mycobacteriosis. We know that we have uh, this local regional uh, dysgeitis. Um, but uh, for the rest, I think, uh, for the proof of concept, I think we need at least uh, to know the exact that we have uh, disseminated disease and that we have uh, abolished the uh, in from gamma pathway or diminished in from gamma pathway assays, I think. What do you think, Trina? Yeah, I agree. So I was going to ask you also if you have any knowledge of is it often difficult to diagnose or to identify mycobacteria in MSMD? Because normally there are a lot of um, bacteria, so normally it shouldn't be so technically difficult to identify mycobacteria, right? Do you know anything about this in these patients? Yes, uh, uh, for our patients, it's very difficult to prove that this hepatosplenomegaly is uh, indeed a, a direct invasion of mycobacteria, sometimes biopsy the liver. Um, but normally we find mycobacteria and we prove the, the disseminated disease by bone marrow aspirates. And that's very easy to find yeah, the the mycobacteria marrow. there. Yeah, that's what yeah. I was asking. Okay, so maybe some more diagnostic work out to do on these patients. Thank you very yes. much. Thank, Thank you, you very much. much Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you. We, we will move on now to the second presenter. Yeah. So uh, the next presentation will be uh, next presenter will be Claudia Claudia Rita from Madrid, Spain, and uh, the presentation is it's very better called the immunologist a delayed diagnosis of excellent chronic granulomatous disease. Claudia, feel free to start. Okay. Um, hello, everybody. Um, I am immunology resident at Ramon y Cajal University Hospital in Madrid. I have nothing to disclose. I'm going to present a case of a 53-year-old woman who was born in Spain to no consanguineous parents. She had no family history of primary immunodeficiency in her family, but her mother presented with recurrent folliculitis during her life. The patient refers after ulcers and folliculitis during uh, her childhood. At the age of 28 years old, she presented with pulmonary tuberculosis treated correctly and without sequelae. After that, she had a couple of cutaneous abscesses and between 2014 and 2017, she required to admission at hospital because of salmonella sepsis. Then in 2018, she was diagnosed as Besset disease in internal medicine and she started colchicine and low dose of prednisone. After that, in 2019, she required a very long hospital admission, more than five months, for anecrotizing lymphadenitis with serratia marcescens isolation, and she needed more than one surgery. She also presented with involuntary weight loss during the last six months, daily dry cough and asthenia. During the admission, the immunological assessment shows a normal full blood counts and immunoglobulins quantification. The HLA B51 was negative and anti-nuclear and anti raw antibody were positive. Uh, she has expanded B memory cells and T and NK were normal. The radiological findings shows a diffuse bilateral lung consolidation and the patient was diagnosed as invasive pulmonary aspergillosis. At this moment, the, their samples were sent to our laboratory. We perform the oxidative burst test with the DHR oxidation after PMA stimulation, where we seen a dual population of neutrophils with a very low proportion of functioning neutrophils when you compare with a healthy control. These results were confirmed by cytochrome C reduction assay. After that, we perform the expression of flavocytochrome B558 in neutrophils 
where we also seen a very low pro uh, proportion of neutrophils that express the cytochrome B558. So the genetical analysis shows a mutation in CYBB because of a change in one nucleotide and this mutation was reported previously as pathological and the patient was diagnosed as X-linked CGD carrier with less than 5% of function in neutrophils and clinical manifestation. Female CGD carrier due to a defect in the GP91 FOX are usually to be considered asymptomatic, but recently uh, some reports uh, shows that these carriers can develop clinical manifestations similar to patients with X-linked CGD. A study from two couple, uh, a couple of years ago shows a correlation between the risk of infection and the percentage of DHR positive neutrophils in this patient in CGD carriers when this uh, percentage is less than 20%. And uh, although this percentage can change during the life, uh, it is a, a good, a good uh, find uh, in this study. At this point, the patient tolerate very poorly the itraconazole as prophylaxis. So a couple of months ago, we offered the patient a bone marrow transplantation. Uh, she was thinking about it, and yesterday the patient talked with the hematologist and decided to perform the bone marrow transplantation. So we start to looking for donors. I want to thank everyone who contributed to this case. Thank you. Thank you very much, Claudia. Uh, let me just see if there are questions from the audience. Not yet. Please don't be shy. And for the other presenters, anyone has any question? If not more, uh, there are there are several questions uh, that can arise here. It's a very beautiful case. Thank you. Thank you for your presentation. Uh, congratulations. Um, it's a very unusual case of extreme ionization and diagnosis without the, um, without the, an affected son. Uh, but uh, it's very interesting to see this uh, extreme ionization to the wrong X chromosome. Mm -hmm. uh, and I wonder if there's another X-linked disease in the other uh, X chromosome that uh, caused this uh, wrong linearization of this uh, of this chromosome it's it would be interesting to know but apart from that um i think that you mentioned that uh, the, the nih study showing that the carriers also can have uh, cgd manifestations and the options are uh, what you mentioned so um i'm i'm not a bmt especially in adults expert so uh i don't know very much very well if um what the results are in a 53 year old uh, lady i don't know if anyone has experience uh, here in a transplant with a 53 year old lady with a cgd um but uh, we have to to wait i think emma morris here is saying that they are excellent the results so Good luck, Emma says, and she's the one to to answer. So the both of them. Seven seven percent overall survival in adults. Uh, Emma Morris says so um, for the adult patients. Okay, and those are the okay. And do you, uh, for Emma, uh, what was the median age of the, these uh, patients? I think it was 36 or something like that. The, the older patient in this paper was 45, I, I think. Okay. Very interesting. Oh, yeah, it was, was late 40s. a little bit yeah. risky that offered the patient the bone marrow transplantation. We discussed uh, with the family and the patient and uh, she had not a really good quality of life, so we decided to to offer the patient 
Yeah, of, but how is it, and how is her lung now? Well, uh, she is still having some lesions in the lungs, but the the aspergillus in the um, ball was negative. But we are not sure if the lesions are residual or inflammation or there are some aspergillus still in there. Yeah, because that can be a question for the transplant. Yes. Okay, any more questions? Uh, so we try, we have a lot of comments here. Sorry, I missed those. So there's a comment we transplanted from uh, Siska Strick. We transplanted a 15-year-old female with extensive autoimmunity, successful but long, slow post-BMT recovery. Uh, Emma says that they have done uh, over uh, kids in mid-50s with good donors. Other, yeah. Pulmonary function critical, that's it. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> Okay, very interesting. Trina, should we move on? Yes. Okay, so... Thank you very much, Claudia. Thank you. I will welcome the next speaker, which is David Love, and with the title, The Chronic Microbiota in Chronic Granulomatous Disorder Demonstrate Distinct Mucosal Patterns Correlating with Colitis Activity and Systemic Inflammation. So, David, please. <laughs> Thank you very much. Uh, thanks for inviting me. Hopefully you can see my slides. Um, so I'm David Lowe. I am an immunologist at the Royal Free and UCL in London. Uh, I work with Emma. So, you know, I would certainly support what you were saying just there about transplanting that last patient and good luck with that. Um, uh, I have done some work with CSL bearing, which is not relevant to this uh, particular talk. So um, the background to my presentation is uh, a study that we did a couple of years ago where we uh, were assessing various non-invasive modalities to assess the severity of CGD colitis. Uh, of course, we can assess it with colonoscopy, and that is still the gold standard, but it's invasive, it's uncomfortable, it doesn't have uh, fantastic satisfaction scores amongst patients. So we investigated various modalities, one of which being MRI scanning, and, and uh, here's a figure from uh, that paper where the MRI scores, three different scores are on the y-axis, the gold standard colonoscopy score on the x-axis, and showing pretty good correlation there uh, and indicating that MRI is a useful way of uh, assessing the, the colitis in these patients. We also found that calprotectin was very good, as you might anticipate. Interestingly, and we'll come back to this in a minute, uh, we found that serum cytokines and serum uh, indicators of inflammation didn't correlate particularly well with severity of colitis uh, as measured by colonoscopy, MRI, or calprotectin. Um, but because we'd done this uh, study and we uh, did a colonoscopy on everybody as part of it, we had uh, biopsies from the, every part of the colon that we reached, uh, and these were stored in RNA later. Uh, and we have gone on to, uh, to perform microbiome analysis on uh, these samples via 16S sequencing. Uh, and we've uh, obviously identified the uh, taxa, the genera of, of bacteria that are present in the mucosal uh, at, um, uh, at sample biopsy samples, but we've also inferred from that the metabolic pathways of the bacteria. Uh, and the reason for that is that you can have two different bacteria, but which essentially fill the same ecological niche. Uh, they have the same metabolic pathways and therefore they have the same function uh, in vivo. So often actually the metabolic pathway analysis is of more relevance than the specific bacteria that are there. Um, so looking at the dominant taxa that we saw here, I've arranged the patients uh, in uh, in order of calprotectin. So with the lowest calprotectin on the left and the highest calprotectin on the right. And two things to point out here. The first is patient number 10 uh, on the right, whose microbiome is absolutely dominated by enterococcus. This is someone with a fairly acute onset, very severe colitis. You can see a very high calprotectin. Uh, and where we have to assume that this enterococcus was in some way associated with uh, that presentation. Now, apart from that patient, you can see that broadly speaking, there's more of that big, uh, the, the dark brown bar at the bottom uh, in the patients on the right who have colitis compared to the patients on the left who don't have colitis. And that's bacteroides. Uh, and sure enough, we do see a positive uh, correlation between bacteroides abundance uh, and the calprotectin level. We see negative correlations with uh, blautia, and we see various other correlations with, uh, with different genera and with metabolic pathways. In terms of the metabolic pathways, those that associate with colitis are very associated with, are very implicated in butyrate uh, metabolism. 
And a lot of this has been described uh, in other inflammatory bowel diseases. Um, alpha diversity, which is a measure of the, uh, the richness of the species that are present, uh, is lower in people with active colitis. That's not a surprise. That's also demonstrated in other uh, inflammatory bowel diseases. Interestingly, also lower in people with a history of colitis, suggesting that the microbiome doesn't return to normal even uh, when the disease is quiescent. Uh, if we look on the, the panels on the right-hand side of this slide, this is beta diversity. So trying to see if, if what's there in terms of the, uh, on the upper panel, the, the taxa, on the lower panel, the metabolic pathways is different in people with colitis versus those without colitis. And you can see there's some separation of the groups, but it's certainly not perfect. Um, so uh, indicating that there might be more uh, to this. So we then went on and we remembered, of course, that the colitis severity didn't correlate particularly well with, uh, with these uh, various markers of inflammation, serum cytokines and, uh, at, at the, and things like soluble CD14 that we'd measured in blood. So we then uh, correlated uh, the, the genera from the 16S um, uh, sequencing and the metabolic pathways with these inflammatory markers and found very strong correlations, in fact, stronger correlations uh, than we saw even with uh, calprotectin. So we asked ourselves, well, perhaps there's an interesting relationship here between the uh, colonic microbiome and systemic inflammation. And sure enough, if you divide the patients on the basis of systemic inflammation, so we divided them on the basis of their, uh, their uh, serum cytokines, et cetera, into two groups, high and low inflammation, they separated really quite nicely. And interestingly, some people with colitis ended up in the low inflammation group, while some people without colitis ended up in the high inflammation group. And here you can see there's very clear differences in the, uh, the the microbiota in terms of both the genera uh, present, uh, you know, the species present, and also the functional pathways uh, that, um, uh, that we anticipate those bacteria to have. Uh, and in fact, if you look at the table at the bottom, you can see that systemic inflammation is the largest contributor to the position within the, the um, matrix, uh, the PCA matrix uh, in the panels above. Uh, and it's a, a bigger uh, contributor even than the individual patient, which is uh, very often uh, the, the largest contributor um, to uh, an individual's microbiome. So to conclude, there seems to be a distinct mucosal microbial signature of CGD colitis with uh, bacteroides being very uh, implicated and blouty and potentially being protective. Um, in people with acute and severe colitis, a, a single pathogenic species may dominate in our uh, patient that was enterococcus. Alpha diversity is lower in patients with colitis or even with a history uh, of colitis. There's a strong relationship between the mucosal microbiome and systemic inflammation, even independent of colitis status, which raises the interesting question that the mucosal microbiome in CGD may actually influence the inflammatory phenotype of this condition, even beyond uh, colitis. So I really need to just thank Mehmet, who did really all of this work. I just come to the conference and take the glory. Uh, and the people who uh, did the endoscopies, et cetera, recruited the patients, Rare Diseases Foundation, who funded us and the patients for participating in the study. Thank you. Thank you very much. So I would like to ask you one question first, a more general one. So what are your thoughts on what came first, the disturbed microbiota uh, or uh, the colitis? So uh, is, are these abnormal uh, bacteria disease modifiers or are they really an etiological agent of colitis? What, what, what are your thoughts? I think that's really difficult to say. Um, I, I mean, I think if you take anyone with an inflamed bowel and anyone with diarrhea, you would expect there to be some disturbance of the microbiota. Um, uh, but I, we do know in many other inflammatory bowel diseases where, of course, they've been more studied and with uh, larger patient numbers, that the microbiota is directly implicated in the pathogenesis of the, uh, uh, of the disease. And the fact that the microbiome doesn't sort of return to what we might just, um, call normal or healthy with treatment, uh, to me, suggests that actually there, there is a, a, a direct effect of the microbiome in driving uh, the colitis, uh, and which to a large extent makes sense, I think, in this condition um, where uh, we know that, that failure to control the, the bacteria adequately and the interaction between uh, host phagocytes and, and the bacteria is, is a crucial part of the pathogenesis. Okay, thank you. So then we have another question here um, from Adriana Elberg. Uh, did you quantify T-cell populations in the gut of these patients? 
Uh, not yet. <laughs> it's a good question. Uh, we do have the, um, obviously residual samples, uh, and at the very least, we would hope to be able to go on and do a, a host transcriptome. Um, uh, if, if we can, then yes, we'll look at individual cellular populations. Right, and also one more on the treatment side. Can we also microbiome? Uh, we give them antimicrobials as prophylaxis and maybe intercurrent antibiotics. Any thoughts? Yeah, so um, we looked at the impact of uh, antibiotics. I mean, all of these patients were on antibiotics, of course. Um, uh, so uh, we couldn't uh, detect any specific signal uh, about uh, uh, antibiotics. Um, but there may be an interesting uh, study there in terms of, you know, can we be smarter with our choice of antibiotics? Uh, you know, is there a role for things like rifaximin uh, in in altering the microbiome in a, a healthier way than cotrimoxazole, which would be our standard prophylaxis? And I think especially given this, this possible uh, relationship with systemic inflammation, um, uh, where I think, you know, we, we'd really like to be able to modify that if we can. And to follow up on this one, um, did any of the patients get interferon gamma? Uh, no. So we don't generally use interferon gamma in the UK. It's not a particularly popular thing to do. Uh, so no, in this study, none of them have, none of them received it. Okay. Can I pick the, uh, the, the next question, okay. Trina, because uh, I was going to ask something that is related with this. Uh, Kathy, were uh, asked what biologic have you found helpful and I would add did that cytokine profiling and correlation with the uh, different species uh, can that in any way help us in a somewhat near future uh, guide our biological therapy in these patients yeah so so possibly I guess is the answer so actually in the, even in the original study we found that the one cytokine that really seemed to correlate with um, colitis severity was IL-12 which raises the possibility that ustekinumab will be useful. And I, I, many of you will have seen, I, I think, a presentation yesterday uh, of ustekinumab in CGD colitis, suggesting it was really effective. We've always been a bit nervous about ustekinumab because of the risk of mycobacterial infection, potentially in this population. If you knock out IL-12 and 23, you'd have thought that would be a, a way of increasing that risk. Um but, uh, I mean, given the choices, I mean, if, if the option is steroids uh, versus that, then it may still be uh, a reasonable option. We have used vedulizumab uh, in a few patients with variable success. Some have responded very well, uh, but some really hasn't been that effective. And we've continued to need additional um, steroids. We are scared of anti-TNF in these patients, as lots of other people are after the NIH series that many of you will be familiar with from a few years ago. And we haven't really tried IL-1 blockade actually yet either. Yeah. Okay, on the basic side, so you suggest that butyrate metabolism is abnormal uh, in, in some of these cases. So any knowledge on which inflammatory pathways or immune uh, T cell or B cell subsets could be affected by this uh, metabolic disturbance? Uh, not as yet. Um, I, I mean, you know, it seems to be it's both biosynthesis and utilization that was increased. So uh, in, in terms of the metabolic pathways. So I, I think we'd need to actually measure butyrate itself because, uh, you know, you could make an argument that it's either going to be increased or decreased in terms of availability. Okay, so that's but, not yeah, for host immune cells. So at the moment, I can't yet extrapolate to what the impact would be. But I mean, that's certainly something we'd, yeah, we'd want to explore. Okay, so thank you very much for a very exciting talk and, and not fully understood uh, subject. Yep. Okay, thank you very much, David. So we'll now proceed. Next uh, presentation will be uh, done by Lucia Leonardi from Rome, Italy, and is a, a case of complement component 7 deficiency associated with Neisseria meningitis infection. Lucia. Okay. Uh, hi, everyone. Yes, my name is Lucia Leonardi, and I'm from uh, Sapienza University in Rome. I have nothing to disclose. So um, our patient is a nine-year-old male who um, was admitted to our emergency room presenting with fever, vomiting, headache, lethargic status, and petechial rashes. 
and uh, um, he didn't have any contact with carriers of um, Syria. And uh, in addition, his uh, cerebrospinal fluid was uh, completely normal at examination. Moreover, a film array uh, that was uh, performed for 40 pathogens that are normally involved in uh, meningitis and encephalitis, uh, uh, encephalitis was completely negative on CFS, but was positive on blood for Nesteria meningitis and um, more specifically for the serogroup B. For these reasons, we tried to better um, understand, you know, if there was any clue in his uh, past history or in his uh, family history that could uh, suggest us uh, something, but actually the family history was completely negative for uh, previous immunodeficiency and negative also for meningococcal disease. And in addition, the parents were not consanguineous. And uh, the, um, sorry, I can't, okay. And uh, in addition, uh, for the past medical history was completely um, you know, negative because it just developed for some really normal disease that are typical for the infancy that were treated without sequelae. Um, the most important uh, clue was the fact that five years um, preceding the um, onset of the sepsis, the, the child was um, vaccinated for meningococcal B, and he actually had two doses of the vaccine as uh, was required for his age. Uh, the first immunological workup was uh, performed uh, one week after the, the sepsis onset, and it was actually quite normal because the child didn't display any alteration, including a, a normal C3 and C4 concentration, except for an alter, alterated uh, lymphocyte subset uh, ratio. Um, in addition, the patient recovered well. He didn't, he didn't have any sequelae. After 14 days of uh, treatment with desametasone, ceftriaxone, uh, inotropic agents, and in addition, he needed to um, administration of high flow oxygen. So uh, both the infectious disease um, colleagues and uh, uh, intensive care pediatrician were wondering if it was the case to keep studying these uh, patients or not, because from one side, uh, the negative family and past history, and also the fact that, uh, um, as we know, the meningococcal B vaccine has not a 100% immunogenity, where um, some kind, you know, a positive clue, while on the other side, it was suspect suspicious the fact of that the, uh, the onset of disease was quite late in time, compared, you know, that the general population. And in addition, the fact that C3 and C4 assessment are unable to rule out um, all um, possible complement de deficiency. So finally, the child was addressed to our unit, the, to the immunological um, pediatric um, unit. And uh, we, did assess, uh, we did an assessment of CH50 that was actually um, reduced, um, reduced compared to the normal range. Um, indeed, uh, this happened actually one month uh, following the onset of the sepsis. At this point, thanks to um, a collaboration that we had with the University of Trieste, Dr. Bulla, we were able to assess um, Navizolab um, immune, enzy immune um, assay um, enzymatic uh, test that was able to, um, uh, to contemporarily uh, assess you know, the, the activity of all the free pathway. And, um, and actually we were able to to see that uh, um, the classic pathway, the lectin pathway, and also the alternative pathway were all uh, reduced in these patients, strongly suggesting the possibility of uh, a deficiency of a late uh, component of the complement uh, pathway. Indeed, the child uh, was actually, um, sorry, I can't move forward. Okay. Uh, thanks to the Dr. Agostinis from the same university, uh, actually she was able with Western blot to, um, to see that uh, the C7 uh, component was completely undetectable in our patient, and this was also confirmed by uh, RNA, so by the RNA study with the PCR. Um, today, um, the follow-up of this patient is that we're still, they're still ongoing uh, testing, uh, molecular testing, even if several SNPs have been detected. Um, we are still um, studying both the child and the parents and the second sibling, uh, trying to figure out what, uh, which mutation is responsible for the protein uh, absence. In addition, the patient has been revaccinated with the also with the tretavalent vaccine, uh, even if the IgA levels to the capsular polysaccharides uh, following the immunization are still uh, are not available yet. 
moreover, what we know is that all first degree relatives showed a normal CH50. The problem for the follow up for us today is that uh, we know that also from literature that there is an impaired response to meningococcal uh, vaccine reported in patients with terminal component, component uh, deficiency. And so we are now wondering uh, how to treat you know, this, this child. So if it's important, uh, it's clear that a more aggressive vaccination strategy would be useful in this patient population, but we don't know which uh, would be the proper timing for a vaccination. And in addition, it's not clear um, if, the, if it would be useful also administration of prophylactics, antibiotics, and when, or if it's possible also to think about other kind of treatment. So finally, with this uh, case report, we would just like to um, put, you know, a light to highlight the fact that uh, uh, complement deficiency are rare, but notably increase the risk of meningococcal infection, uh, even uh, if they are generally characterized by lower mortality. However, uh, it would be mandatory to systematically uh, search uh, for for this deficiency in patients presenting with meningococcal disease, even more if they have been already vaccinated. Uh, this um, because it, it's it's necessary because in this way we can promptly minimize the likelihood of further infection, and in addition we can identify family members that uh, may be affected. Finally, it is important also to decide a strict follow-up of this patient, even though, uh, as uh, I was uh, explaining before, we still need many more uh, further prospective studies in order to better understand and to clarify the vaccination schedule of these patients or all the possible treatment. Thank you. Thank you, Lucia. Can I just stop sharing? Yeah. So on the lower part of the screen, stop sharing. Perfect. Okay, let's see if there are any questions. Yeah, so um, we have one question from the audience, from Nacho. Uh, he is asking, what about uh, T-follicular helper T cells and switch memory B cells? Did the patient achieve normal serum bacterial CD activity against meningococci? Uh, we didn't perform this test. Actually, they've been performed in another uh, center, uh, but this were still ongoing. And unluckily, this was a recent diagnosis. And then with the COVID-19, many things have been a tiny bit um, stopped. Uh, we don't have this information yet. Okay. Uh, because um, for uh, Bexero, for the four-component uh, meningococcal, an issue is coverage. Uh, I'm not com uh, I don't know the coverage of... Uh, of this vaccine in Italy, uh, in Portugal, it's uh, more or less 65% uh, coverage. So uh, vaccine failure in most cases is because of uh, uh, low coverage. And uh, because we, we performed, we investigated all, all, we investigate all patients with the vaccine failures and most of them, it's because of uh, the, the strain is not covered by the vaccine. Uh, do you know that info? Did you, were you able to identify men B in blood cultures and then study the ST clone? No, we were not able because this was conducted mostly in the emergency room and when it was addressed to our unit, it was one month later. Um, what, what we know is that in Italy, the coverage is of the 75% with the four antigens that has been used in the vaccine. This yeah. is the yeah, almost... Yes, because that can lead us, uh, guide us in uh, how 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 much are we going to invest in studying these patients? Because uh, for the it's uh, apparently uh, the late component uh, complement deficiency they respond well to to the um, four component vaccine. So uh, the studies that have been performed show that normally they are very good responders, and even for the conjugate um, the for the ACWY. Uh, vaccine, the conjugated vaccine, they respond very well. So sometimes they don't respond to polysaccharide vaccines the for, uh, for meningococcal um, polysaccharide vaccine, but, but for the conjugated, normally they respond well. Um, so I'm not completely sure if this was uh, indeed a problem of uh, the host or a bacteria that was not covered by the vaccine. Um, I don't know what what you normally do to your comp uh, complement efficiency patients, but <laughs> uh, okay. So um, 
I don't do normally. I don't do antibiotic prophylaxis, uh, and uh, just keep with uh, the vaccine schedules. Um, uh, the, the the biggest difficulty is knowing when to revaccinate these patients uh, because we're not completely sure how long the how long lasting are these antibodies. But um, but I don't use antibiotics normally in the, uh, in these patients. So, is there any other question? Can I ask a question. Of course. So, yeah, so uh, in Denmark, we do not vaccinate against meningococci in the childhood vaccination program. So would you suggest that any child uh, or adult with the first time invasive meningococcal disease should have complement screening, uh, screening for complement deficiency? And which fraction do you think would have complement deficiency? Which so um, because you don't vaccinate it, then uh, I mean I mean it makes it a bit more difficult to answer. I think that uh, it depends on the age also, the age of onset, or on the family history and on other infection that maybe the child had again already. So this could give them some information about proceeding or not. And of course, maybe the CH50 is that when it, it, it will give you an idea of the classic and the late component uh, uh, pathway. So it would be and the AH50 also the alternative. So maybe this would be the two main important uh, assay to do. But yeah, but do, 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 do like you think it should be done in in every child with meningococcal disease? I will do in case the disease is uh, the onset is in a child that has uh, some kind of extra um, reason for. So in the, in our case, for example, the child was a nine year old child. Usually, um, you know, later in time, it's more possible to have a complement deficiency. While in the early age, the, uh, as we know, there are children that are more predisposed to meningococcal disease. So maybe this could be one reason that could exclude the, the, the possibility of a, a PID. In addition, I will better maybe go in depth on the, on the family history because it's possible that you can find other meningococcal disease in the family or from other uh, gonorrhea disease. I don't know. So in this case, we'll give you also some other extra information to take your decision. I would I would say the full picture maybe before uh, before yeah. going through. Yeah, so it's an important discussion. Yeah, yeah. if I'm allowed to, uh, to give my opinion on this, Trina, because uh, um, I at the moment I I don't do exactly as I did in the past because um, uh, Neisseria is a nasty bacteria, so you don't have to be immunodeficiency uh, immunodeficiency to have a Neisseria infection, um, and. Uh, in the past, I never screened for um, complement deficiency in patients who have classical invasive meningococcal disease and didn't have anything that was strange, either consanguinity, uh, either death, familial serial, or something like that. But now at the moment with all the vaccines, we have less than 50 cases of serial infection, uh, invasive infection in Portugal uh, per year, so uh, five zero. So at the moment, I think it's very easy to perform a CH50 functional assay uh, to rule out uh, late component um, complement deficiency. So I think it's a very easy uh, screening assay and very uh, cheap screening assay. So I think it doesn't harm to do it, I think. Yeah, I think we, we also do it quite often in the adults, um, but don't find complement deficiency that often, but it's important to realize when it's there. But other, can I, sorry, just add something? But on the other hand, by looking at literature, you can also see many reports of people that had many, uh, I mean, recurrent infection from Syria, and maybe they were not investigated before the third. Uh, so maybe, you know, it's important to find a balance and to yeah. figure out what is the At least time. second time, yes. Yeah. Because they, they are described. Well, that's mandatory, I think. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> okay. okay, I think we can proceed. Yeah, Trina. thank you very much, Lucia. So uh, the next and final speaker is Lara Teixeira, who will present uh, on the IL-12 interferon gamma axis and the prophylactic management of tuberculosis in an endemic country. Hi, everyone. My name is Lara Teixeira. I am a fellow in pediatric allergy and immunology at the Federal University of Sao Paulo, Brazil. 
I'm really glad to be here today discussing my poster, the interleukin-12, interferon gamma axis, and the prophylactic management of tuberculosis in an endemic country. First of all, I have nothing to disclose. Interleukin-12, interferon gamma axis, has an essential role in the immune response to mycobacterial infections. Inborn errors of immunity affecting this pathway may cause severe tuberculosis. BCG is part of vaccination calendar in Brazil, and it protects against some disseminated forms of TB, as seen in POTS disease. This is a cross-sectional study undertaken by a review of the medical records of a patient with innate effect of the interleukin-12 interferon gamma axis and POTS disease. She used isoniazid as prophylaxis. So I'm presenting the case about that 19-year-old girl who has no previous history of vaccine reactions, including BCG. At 11 months of age, she had osteomyelitis due to Staphylococcus aureus. At nine years old, she presented with cervical deformity and gait changes with progression to left leg paralysis. She performed a spine MRI that showed an expensive heterogeneous formation in the cervical thoracic junction involving multiple vertebral bodies and an extensive paravertebral mass with extension to the vertebral canal determining expressive compression on the spinal cord. Parents referred to be among household contacts. Bone and intervertebral disc biopsy of the cervical spine showed a chronic granulomatous inflammatory process of tuberculoid type with extensive areas of necrosis and foci of dystrophic calcification. Bone culture revealed mycobacterium tuberculosis complex. She was diagnosed with POTS disease and was treated with TB drugs for one year. year. She performed a functional evaluation of this pathway when she was 11, and it showed a phosphorylation defect of STAT4. She used isoniazid for 10 months when it was withdrawn by the infectology team as she was clinically stable. So here you can see the production of interferon gamma interleukin-12 which activates transcription factors as STAT4, and this uh, stimulates the differentiation of naive CD40 cells in t helper one subset and a greater production of interferon gamma as well. This amplifies this response. To conclude, inborn errors of the interleukin-12 interferon gamma axis are increasingly recognized. However, the best way to manage it and when to use exogenous interferon gamma therapy is still a controversial issue. In Brazil, in the last 10 years, there were around 70,000 new cases of TB per year. So I'll leave you with some questions to ponder. Isoniazid prophylaxis, when to start, when to discontinue, and for how long? Here at our immunology center, we believe that isoniazid prophylaxis should be done for life. Thank you very much. So thank you very much for this interesting presentation. Um, I can see we have a question from the audience with a raised hand. I will try to allow um, Dr. Geraldine Ona to talk. Is this possible now? Uh, Geraldine, I think you can talk if you unmute yourself now. Geraldine, if you are listening to us, can you unmute? Yes. Yeah, so the, the question. I 
had you, I think you had then it right, Geraldine. Yes, so it was a yeah. mistake. Sorry. Perfect. Now you're muted again. Okay, so so I have a question. Do you think that there could be a gene panel investigating IL twelve interferon gamma defects in all patients with atypical microbacterial infection or all patients with TB or what are your suggestions for screening? Um, actually, <laughs> here in Brazil, <laughs> TB is endemic. So many people ha will have, uh, especially in poor conditions. Um, it's because she had a severe disease she uh, she uh, progressed with life flight paralysis and I think uh, she was referred to our immunology center to start this investigation. So uh, we did it, but we don't have access to gene or genetic or molecular uh, tests. So uh, it's difficult to know for sure what is what it is her real problem but so but i i think it's correct and but i don't i'm not sure we should investigate everyone no probably not possible and do you think that any flow assays or uh, is there anything that from the immunologic point of view that we could do to to know what this patient had and could that could that guide us in terms of uh, uh, prophylaxis or therapeutics in this uh, in this patient um, I, I i don't i don't think so we, we use isonize it as our routine for other patients um but i i'm not sure if there is any uh, genetic defect or immune defect that could guide us to any medication. Yeah, because uh, um, flow can really help us uh, finding the receptor for IL-12, a receptor of it from gummy, the one or two, and that could help us uh, try to stratify the risk and know if we have to use it from gamma or only antibiotics, is it from icin or anything else. So it's... Uh, Sometimes it can help us uh, if, if we have access to those uh, to those assets. They are not easily available here. David, yeah, can I just ask? Was the um, the patient was already on isoniazid prophylaxis? Uh, she used for one year, but it, this was ten about around ten years ago, and a okay. few weeks ago, actually, she went to us complaining. Uh, uh, Spine uh, pain, intense spine pain, and we are now uh, investigating uh, active TB or maybe another thing. Sure. Uh, and have you seen in your patients who are on isoniazid prophylaxis any cases of breakthrough TB? Because, of course, the concern then is that they would have isoniazid resistant disease yeah. uh, and it would be even harder to treat. So, because I mean, that is, it's a really difficult decision, I think, in a, in a country of high endemicity as to whether to keep these people on long term isoniazid. I, I think I would agree it probably is a good idea. It's not, fortunately, we don't have to worry about it so much in most of Europe, but, um, but yeah, that is the risk. Amazing. That's the main concern uh, uh, about active TB in in this patient, but we we are very concerned that maybe in the future she ha she could have any other more severe TB disseminated TB. So it's it's really a difficult decision that we would like all your opinions. Because we don't know for sure mm. what is the best for her. I have a question also. So it's still discussed how to manage latent TB. So in a patient without an immune deficiency and maybe without even active disease, how do you manage this in Brazil? Would you would you treat with isoniazid? Yes, with isoniazid. Yeah. Right. Yeah, 
I think um, knowing these effects would help. Knowing exactly what the patient has would help us make decisions, to be honest. Uh, try to have the gene. <laughs> that will help you. Okay, I think we, I think we have to finish now, Trini. Yes. We? Yes. yes. So, any other questions? I don't see any. So, yeah. I don't think so. So um, I think we have to finish. Thank you all very much for um, for being here with us and uh, take care. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. <laughs>